Hi everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today about alert fatigue in shock. Um, here's a quick introduction of myself. You probably haven't heard of me. I'm a bit new face in the Finnish infosec scene, first time presenter, so I'm pretty nervous. So I I've been working as a security analyst at the SOC at Optimus for a year now. And I have also been studying at the University of Yuvaskula for two years now, and I'm hoping to graduate this autumn. And I'm studying cybersecurity there. So that's a quick introduction of me. So, Does this look familiar to all the blue team people here today? Um, unfortunately, this is the reality of a sock. But why we might have these issues in sock that when you come to work and every screen is turning red, everything is critical, there's millions of alerts, and you just become dull. You don't you don't you can't focus on the actual issues anymore. So Homer here decides to just shut them off since he can't do anything about it. This is not the intended state of a shock by all, no means. Um, my talk today is about how we can improve the situation by creating more robust and defined automated detection on different incidents. So let's get started. So what's the goal here? Um, the goal of this presentation is to demonstrate the current situation, which many SOCs face today. And, and I'm also going to introduce something I call the detection logic kill chain. It's a, it's a little framework I've been working on my master's thesis. I've been doing this spring. And the goal is to shift our minds from the signature-based detection and move towards the intelligence base. So, we can see at the bottom there are hash values, IP addresses, domain names. Those are static values. Um, they are pretty easy to find. They can be found in many logs. And uh, let's take a scenario that you have some intelligence that uh, malicious IP address has been known to spread ransomware, for example. So you might just take the quick win and write some detection rule that if this IP address is shown anywhere, alert. And yeah, that's basically the definition of signature based detection. And we also need that. We need our bases covered. But if we want to improve as blue team members, and really detect those things we are supposed to see. So APTs, more advanced cyber criminals, and what have you. So this means that we need to focus more on the TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And the picture here is called Pyramid of Pain. And it can be used as a meter for maturity of a blue team. 
meaning that if you can uh, see things at the top of the pyramid, you're more mature than when you're looking at the bottom values such as IP addresses and hash values. So uh, this is the threat detection framework or the detection kill chain, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is something I've been working on the master's thesis and it has six steps and it is based on a scientific research method called design science research method and it has six steps as shown there um, just a quick rundown more in depth on that um, i have i have modified the original design science research method to more match the use case here to improve detection. So first of all, we need to identify the threats. And by that, I mean, we have to really think what is a threat, what, what kind of things make up a threat. It's more, it's more than just an IP address. We saw on Twitter by someone who said this IP address is malicious. Once we have identified the threat, um, we need to start thinking about how we can detect said threat, such as, um, I mentioned the TTP earlier. So in my mind, it's the most logical thing to start identifying the threat by going from the tactic phase. So I'll go into that later, but tactics mean the large picture. Um, the attack framework by Mitre uh, has, for example, command and control as one tactic, which includes many other techniques. Um, once we have kind of made that requirements how to detect the threat, we can start moving towards the use case, which is the SIEM use case. So we start to build our search queries, start to map out if we have the appropriate logs, log sources, and can we detect the threat? If so, yeah, that's good. And the next step is to take that SIEM use case and demonstrate and evaluate it. It's those demonstration and evaluation are kind of mixed since the idea is to put the search query in the seam and try to find out if you can actually find the threat you're looking for. So this is a kind of an iterative process where you make some changes to better account for the threat to cover all bases. And once you have are satisfied with the results, you need to move to the communication phase, which is the last one. And in this case, it means writing a Sigma rule. And I forgot to mention at the beginning, if you have any questions during the presentation, please write them at Discord and I will gladly answer them during this presentation. And we will have a few minutes at the end of the presentation also to go through questions. So let's start going through the, the lo logic here. So threat identification. What actually is a threat? Um, that's a tricky question. You, it's not that black and white. You need to know quite a bit about different threats and for me, it, it's one of the greatest resources is the attack framework since it contains known and unused adversary 
tactics, techniques, and procedures. So that's a great place to start. And we ask that attack framework has 12 different tactics um, describing the whole life cycle of a cyber attack ranging from the initial access to the impact, like destroying assets or exfiltrating data. So the attack framework is a great resource. It's a structure and contains various resources on different threats. So I suggest everyone to check it out if you already haven't. Um, I have a <laughs> really bad example of how to use the attack framework and use my detection logic framework. And, and the example here is we have an Azure AD account, which has been successfully fished. And I'm going to use tactic initial access here, since this is a typical scenario where the attacker starts their um, campaign by gaining access, gaining the first foothold on the target environment. So, quick recap tactics are the umbrella terms containing techniques. Um, about techniques, how can threats be detected? How can you detect this guy hammering away at his keyboard? Um, as mentioned in the philosophy paper of the attack framework, techniques represent how an adversary accomplishes the tactical objective. So, since we have the tactic of initial access, so the adversary is trying to gain the initial access into the environment. Um, but how is he going to achieve that? He's just going to say, okay, we need to gain access. But the next question is how? So there are many techniques. And as I already said, the presentation is about the compromised AD account. So in this example, the attacker can achieve his tactical goal by using valid accounts or phishing. I think they're kind of the same since you gain the valid accounts by phishing and you can fish with valid accounts. So, so yeah, so let's move to the procedures. So Procedures are the kind of the exact examples of how an APT group has used. So when looking at the attack framework, um, there were several APT groups which have used, you guessed, valid accounts to achieve their original tactical goals. So what this means for the detection logic framework, we are going to construct a SIM search query matching the earlier stages where we gave out the requirements like we need to detect this and that. So the next step, When we have the use case, we have now the tactics, techniques, and procedures written down into our SIM use case. Uh, the last slide will make this more clear, I promise. So bear with me. The next step is to apply that use case and demonstrate and evaluate the detection logic. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't show an actual hijacked Azure AD account examples here. 
for reasons. So you're just going to have to imagine that's you as the blue team analyst going through the logs, trying to modify your search query to better match the original goal of detecting a threat. So when we are doing the demonstration and evaluation of the detection logs, we have to really think about what was the original threat that we are trying to uncover here. So in our case, it's the we need we are worried about compromised accounts, especially in Azure. So when you are going through the logs and the various fields and their values, there might be, depending on different SIEM solutions, different fields. So when you are doing this, please pay attention to those which do not seem to be technology related. So the goal is also to be as technology, technologically independent. So we, we're not relying on vendors or any other solutions to give us a quick fix, but we are trying to take the take the um, relevant values of the fields. For example, in our case, when we are going through the logs, we could start by going all the Azure AD audit logs. We have thousands of login logs, I guess. Um, then you have to start cutting down those logs which are definitely not related to potentially hijacked accounts. So by eliminating non-relevant data is going to help you understand the threat better and improve the logic to the point that it actually does what it, it is meant to do. And while you're doing this, um, I forgot to mention it, you probably read on the slide that this framework also applies to threat hunting. And this is kind of a hybrid of threat hunting and creating automated detection alert rules. So you're kind of doing both with a bit of a more of a threat hunting aspect. Since you're going through the environment you're going to protect, so you're just you're not going to be able to just, or maybe you can just put the vendor provided rules on and yeah, that, that's it. Let's forget about it and move to the other. But by going through this rigorous process, you are, at least in my experience, I've done this. For a while now, I started to understand more about the tactics, techniques, and procedures, and have really changed my uh, way of thinking about the detection. It was just easier to have those indicators compromise and create detection logic around them. And yeah, that's it. But those things are not permanent. IPv4 addresses get reassigned, hashes go old, then your detection logic doesn't work anymore. So try to build your detection around those constant parts. So I hope this last slide will make this a bit more understandable. So here is a Sigma rule. I created this. this um, earlier today. So we have some time. So uh, let's go through it. The process of creating a Sigma rule. So once your first, um, your five previous steps are done and you're happy with the results, 
on the framework kind of requires you to document and communicate your solution to the problem. So, as I mentioned, technology independence, it's because um, Sigma rules are meant to be created as a um, one size fits all. It doesn't matter what your SIM solution is, it should work in every SIM. So you're not married to your vendor and it's, I think it's pretty readable comparing to some vendor technologic where I like um, you have this specific vendor and they have their own event identifier. So event identifier 1337 equals to, I don't know, EDOS. And you try to use that on a different vendors. And that's that's kind of your own only way of seeing DDoS because it works on that particular vendor. But you decide to change your firewalls, you don't have any detection on DDoS again. So, so starting from the top, we have the Sigma rule, it's pretty self-explanatory. You have the title and the status is either experimental or stable, depending on, well, the official requirement was like three months in production. It doesn't produce false positives or anything. But if you write these rules for your own environment, you can put it to stable or stable or experimental. Um, the description is to, this also works as documentation for other analysts. If, for example, you write the rules and somebody else is doing triage and doesn't understand how the logic works, they can refer to this documentation. And you have some description and references, so that should give the other analysts a good idea of what, what this detection logic is trying to achieve. So in Sigma, you also can and should map the detection logic to the attack framework to make it even more globally usable. So in this case, I use the initial access tactic and the technique of valid account and the point zero zero four means cloud account since we're using Azure AD um, author who wrote it when it was written, um, then the log source. This might not apply to everyone since I wrote it in our scene. And these are fields found there. So it might not work out of box. But where you we're looking for Azure application security events and the product is the Azure Active Directory. And the product could also be like firewall, windows, what have you, and the categories like the, I don't know, process creation, packet filtering, intrusion prevention systems. Um, the tricky part comes at the detection, since this um, lines 13 to 18 are actually the Sigma rule. The other is just documentation and comments. So in selection, we have now three fields which have different values and we have the action user locked in application is Azure Active Directory and the status is succeeded. Okay, so that means we have three fields which have values and these, this is the detection logic, but to make it harder, um, we have the condition um, the selection basically is a variable containing the values of action application status. So this was kind of hard to document, but the idea is to you know, see if somebody has logged in from two countries at the same time. So it searches for logins from two or more countries. Um, in the time span of two, two hours, and the sim needs to enrich 
the source address to display geolocation. And the fields are useful fields when investigating when this alert happens. And false positives is you can write if you have some known false positive vulnerability scanner. You can write its IP address there if you don't want to share it. And lastly, you have the level, low, medium, high, critical, how to react to the rule. And Sigma rules are meant to be shared with others, or you can keep yourself. And when writing these Sigma rules, try to be as seam agnostic as possible so it will work on other seams. So that's my presentation. I hope it made kind of sense to someone at least. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Yusa. Uh, we actually have a few questions for you here on the chat. Uh, so Bubble is asking, uh, what is the most interesting C2 server you have seen on Wild and why? Um, I have to think about an OPSEC answer. Well, C2, um, that's command and control where a malware co communicates with a server to receive more instructions on what to do. Um, uh, I personally haven't seen any like that interesting interesting stories except some persistent malware which we have really had to dig deep to figure out what's causing these callbacks. Uh, one was even relate, if I remember correctly, to a botnet. And once we found out, it was just some bit more advanced malware and we were able to remove it. So unfortunately, I don't have any interesting war stories. I, I, sorry to disappoint. It's OK. Uh, we have another question as well. So. Uh... Balduri is asking uh, a question about the Sigma rule formats. Uh, have you found any good ways to implement whitelisting techniques in the rule syntax? Uh, like in the, um, he's giving an example, uh, the example rule, there can be a, a pretty many common false positives regarding uh, geolocations. Um, what I usually tend to do. Um, I basically write these Sigma rules for our own environment and I haven't really shared them. So I've been kind of selfish and made some lists in the scene where I have um, written down some IP addresses of known false positives and the search query um, reads the lists and doesn't include them. So that's one way. And once when you're writing the Sigma rule, you can write it to the condition. Uh, I don't really remember how to do it right away, but there's like some syntax that you can like, like I have used here, source address equals country, like source address not in list X. I hope that kind of helped. I don't know. All oh, right. I'm I in the same. Uh, yeah. Things. Yeah. There, there was one more question uh, from Balduri. Uh, when is your thesis ready? And uh, he would love to read it. So if it will it be uh, public or? Yes. All master's theses are public by nature, and I hope to have it ready like in September, October, latest. I'm trying to work it during the summer, but I've been kind of busy with work, so I, I'll try to find some time to publish it. And 
hopefully hopefully it happens during autumn all right thank you very much Yusa. there was one more question about the uh, uh, stream future talks uh, or is this just during the COVID time uh, I can answer that uh, we haven't done any decisions yet this is the first time we are streaming ever and probably we will continue this at least during the COVID uh, after the COVID we will see how if you like this we will probably do this in, in the future as well so let's see how, how we will end up with this one and also there was some nice uh, discussion about the uh, c2 build over the discord uh, um, there was actually this week uh, news about that there has been a c2 build over c uh, discord so there is already that one um, in, in place but yeah thank you very much Yuso. and uh, next we move on to the next speaker who will be Timo and uh, we will be back in a few minutes. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks you.